This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast, episode 32, and Sean is going to be back on the air with me again today. It was kind of weird doing an episode without you, I have to say. We are here with Denise Diskin from QLaw, which is a Seattle-based organization, and Denise is going to tell you a little bit about it, and the focus of today's episode is navigating identity documents. So I know this is something that a lot of people have written in and asked us about, asked us about at conferences, and I ran into another person that works at QLaw and talked about having you guys come on and do an episode. So I'm I'm happy this is actually happening because this was about six months ago that we first talked about it. So Denise, tell us a little bit about yourself and QLaw and sort of what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. Thank you. So I am the chair of the what is called the GLBT Legal Clinic here in King County in Washington. And the GLBT Legal Clinic is a program of the QLaw Foundation. And the QLaw Foundation is a legal organization, the sister of the QLaw Association, which is a bar association for GLBT attorneys. So the QLaw Foundation is the community outreach arm of that. And we have several programs. We do summer grants for law students who are doing GLBT legal work to support that because it's often not paid or very low paid work. And so we want to support attorneys who are, you know, being trained in that to, to get that experience. We also have Project Outreach, which is a periodic community panel project. So we put on panels about, we've done family formation um, for GLBT folks, as well as elder law and school issues, particularly focused on school bullying. The GLBT Legal Clinic is another program of the QLaw Foundation. And we have a monthly legal clinic where we do 30-minute consultations for free consultations with attorneys for folks who need legal help. And um, we also do on-site clinics periodically with local organizations sort of in collaboration um, to help bring our legal consultation model to those folks who are being served by those organizations. I should say also that the QLaw Foundation is a completely volunteer-run organization, which is interesting because it, it, we are largely made up of attorneys, although there's also community members involved. So we're a busy bunch of folks. <laughs> um, and so in addition to chairing the GLBT Legal Clinic Committee, I also, in my sort of paid work life, am an attorney at a a small firm here in Seattle called Teller and Associates, where I do employment discrimination work as well as some family law, and specifically focus on on um, serving the GLBT community in my practice. And um, and I'm very happy to do that. They're my my folks, and so I like to to. I'm very lucky to be able to do that in my work and and serve our community in my work. So I will also just do a quick privilege check-in that I, I do have a couple of fairly big privileges walking into this in terms of the, the usual categories. I identify as female and I'm easily read as female, which makes, you know, life smooth in, in many ways. Also am partnered with a trans man, but we, you know, have a lot of passing privilege. Um, I'm also white. And the other big privilege that I carry, particularly with respect to this, is I carry the privilege of access to the legal system and language in the legal system. Like this is a language that I have spent a fair amount of time learning how to speak and a system that I've spent a fair amount of time gaining access to. And the legal system is one where people often interact with it, whether they like it or not, help people access the system in an empowered way through my work. The other major privilege that I carry with this is that I'm not trans. So I haven't had to go through these processes myself. I've walked with other people through the process, but have not have not ever been talking about my own identity and my own gatekeeping ability and you know ability to have access to these systems while I'm doing this. And so that and I really I feel like our community has a lot of anecdotal knowledge that that comes into this and a lot of experiential knowledge and I don't have that. And so while I I know that the court system, the gatekeeping system, the legal system that we work with has a lot of, is supposed to have a lot of consistency to it. It doesn't often. And so I really welcome the anecdotal knowledge and experiential knowledge that our community has about identity documents in particular, because I know how it works when I've witnessed the court system working, but it works differently in lots of different situations. So 
I would really, you know, encourage uh, your listeners to, to, you know, I'm going to sort of run through a lot of procedures and things like that, but to share experiential and anecdotal knowledge with us, because I think that that is really vital to the service that particularly the GLBT Legal Clinic provides. We don't see everything. We don't know everything. Our community knows. And so... We can't serve the community if we don't know. So for folks out there listening, please feel free to write into GenderCast at GenderCast at gmail.com so that we can um, pass on the information in regards to experiences that you're having out there. It is so important for us to share information because that's the only way that we can actually advocate for ourselves and have strategies around some of this stuff. So the next question that we have is kind of just some more detail about what is QLA, what kind of population does it serve, what services do you guys provide, how it came about, and or what are some of like the organizations? I know you said that you were volunteer based. So do you have funders or organizations that support you guys in the community? Yeah, absolutely. I can talk about all of those things. <laughs> you know, as I mentioned, the QLA Foundation is a is an organization that has several programs, but the GLBT Legal Clinic in particular, we do 30 minute consultations with people who either live in or have legal issues arising in King County, Washington. Unfortunately, for various reasons, we cannot handle criminal defense issues, and we can't serve folks outside of King County, Washington, although we can sometimes provide referrals if to, to more local um, organizations. And you can also access our, our clinic without having to identify in any particular way, And um, which I think is, is actually important to mention as a free legal service because many, many legal services do fantastic work but have income requirements, and we don't have any of that. And so I think you know that, that's sort of a, a unique ability that we have to serve folks. That said, in terms of the, the type of population that we, we tend to reach, we majority of people who are currently ac accessing the clinic are people who are considered by the federal poverty index to be fairly low or middle income. So we're, you know, the purpose of the clinic is to reach folks who wouldn't have access to an attorney in other situations. We also are serving an increasing number of people who identify as something other than male or female, which we are really proud of. And that I think is a direct result, both of our, our community sort of knowing about us and spreading the word and doing a lot of great publicity for us. <laughs> and thank you all. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and also we were generously funded by the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, St. Jones Abbey here in um, Seattle, to do these on-site clinics where essentially, you know, the clinic was founded, um, we've been around for three years, and we've served over 330 clients in those three years. And we, it was created because there weren't direct legal services specifically serving the GLBT community. And I should say also that I use GLBT because I'm so used to the GLBT legal clinic name, and I know that folks have other acronyms, so I hope that that's okay to use. Um, you know, I, I like all of the other acronyms and, and support them and use this one because it's the one that I'm used to using. <laughs> so we were generously funded by the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence to do to do these on-site legal clinics. And um, the reason for that is that, you know, we've been doing the monthly legal clinics for about three years and had originally sort of gotten started doing that because of knowing that there, there weren't direct legal services for our community. And so really wanted to, um, I mean, there's great organizations in Washington doing great direct legal services, but they weren't focused on the queer and trans community, you know, and, and folks sort of identifying that way and don't necessarily provide specific training to their attorneys on those issues. Wonderful organizations, but we train our attorneys on queer and trans issues specifically particularly because they're constantly changing. <laughs> and so that, that's something that's very important to us. And also to create a safe space for people to come to where they know that, you know, at this time when they're dealing with potentially very challenging legal questions and, and questions that can feel very scary, that we're there as a welcoming space to, to come in exactly how folks are and feel like they can get help from folks who are not going to, you know, carry any judgment. That's a very core mission um, of what we do. And the on-site legal clinic model was created because we realized we have our monthly clinic and it's on Capitol Hill and we serve a chunk of the community, but not all of the community. There are lots and lots of folks that we looked at our demographics and realized we weren't reaching. I just sort of looked at it, you know, and did the math and thought we can serve folks who have a legal issue that 
comes up once every four weeks or, you know, where they can wait a few weeks for our next clinic or they can they have the access to get to the top of the hill. We and, and particularly one of the, the legal clinic committee members had this great idea of, well, why don't we partner with local organizations and talk to them about what do your folks need? You know, who are you serving and, and do they have legal needs? And, and can we adapt our model around what you're doing and bring what we're doing to you to better serve a, a bigger chunk of our community and a bigger group of, of folks. And that's been really wonderful. And we, we've done three on-site clinics. We did two with the Ingersoll Gender Center here in Seattle. Um, and then we did one also with Bailey Boucher House, which is a local nursing home and day program for folks with long-term illnesses and particularly HIV and AIDS. And so we were able to, to, to do a clinic there as well. We're also lucky to be supported by other organizations. The Pride Foundation is very supportive of the Q Law Foundations, um, particularly Project Outreach. And the legal clinic is also supported by Seattle Counseling Services, who currently hosts our clinic, and Seattle Area Support Groups, which is a former host of our clinic. Also, the ACLU and Lifelong AIDS Alliance and the law student groups do a lot of publicity for us and really do a lot of outreach and, and support and collaboration with us. So we're very blessed to have that. That's great that you're involved in so many different organizations and with only being three years old, it sounds like. I'm always overwhelmed with how many queer and trans and LGBT organizations there are in Seattle. So I'm sure there's lots of opportunity ahead of you too. That's yeah. amazing. And one thing I will say is that if folks in, in Seattle and King County are members of organizations that you think would benefit from, and not necessarily just members, but if you know of organizations that would benefit from our services or from a collaboration, you know, please do let us know. Um, and you know, we're constantly looking for groups to, to hook up with. So the next question will actually lead into the next several questions. So maybe just a really general overview of how Q Law can help folks trying to navigate um, changing identity documents, because that is the focus of our episode today is to do a 101, if you will, for folks in King County and, and the state of Washington trying to change their identity documents around name and gender marker. So that's what we'll be focused on. And if you want to add anything a little bit more around the scope of what today's episode will be about in terms of that. How QLaw can help folks change their identity documents. You know, The first thing I would say is if you're in King County, come to our clinic and you can set up an appointment by calling 206-235-7235. That's 206-235-7235. <laughs> Get set up with an appointment to talk with us about what you may need to do. Even if you're kind of at the very beginning of, of these processes, we can help strategize um, you know, what order to do things in, how much you need to do given what you feel like you need. We can provide paperwork for all different kinds of identity document changes and help you fill it out. And one thing I will mention is that what I'm going to talk about is specific to Washington and and specifically even to King County. I can speak generally to non-Washington issues and federal issues. It, at no point is any of what we're talking about legal advice, which I realize sounds like I'm doing the attorney covering my high knee <laughs> thing. And, and, I, you know, and, and I am to a certain extent, but I'm also sort of trying to manage expectations. I don't want folks who are in other jurisdictions because I know you have listeners from all over the world. I don't want folks to hear some of what I'm saying and some of the procedures I'm talking about and think, oh, this is how it works here too. To have a bad experience by sort of relying on that. That would be terrible in, in my feeling. And particularly because I think that these are not, I don't think of these necessarily as identity documents because they're not actually about identity. They're about gate, gatekeeping and they're about access and they're about having someone else vouch for you being who you are. I don't like the system that we have. And I don't like that it asks people to do that. I feel like it's very oppressive for people to be asked to vouch for themselves and ask, you know, to prove who they are on this consistent basis. And as an attorney, I see political meta reasons that it happens the way that it does. But the processes that, that are involved in these documents and the gatekeeping that is involved in these documents is something I, I have a lot of difficulty with. So I want it to change from the, the legal clinic's philosophy try to work very holistically and think very holistically about organizing movements that are happening from lots of other places and how legal support interacts with that. Because I think that we do need a different system for this. That said, until we get to that system, people have to, you know, they're going to, yeah, if you don't come to the legal system, the legal system may come to you. <laughs> and again, not speaking as someone who goes through this, but, but it can be an empowering place sometimes to to take the, str the strategic first step of, okay, I'm going to make this choice to engage with the legal system in this way to protect myself. If the legal system comes to me, I'm not sort of on the back foot. I'm 
you know, ready to engage with it in a way that is going to keep me whole. Um, I think that's a really good point to make, and especially because I think queer and trans people are often like the most affected by horrific things that happen within the criminal punishment system. And I know that we're not necessarily talking about the criminal justice system side, but we are talking about the justice system and navigating it. And I think I just want to reference really quick, a really cool, it's like a, it's a series of articles that Dean Spade wrote just a, about why we document gender and kind of gets into sort of like governmental control kind of issues around why gender is even documented and why we collect it and when there's a need to have and when there's not and the fact that we shouldn't even have to have a gender marker on our driver's license isn't really the focus of today's episode it's that we're offering resources and really like getting you through today and the how to's like I'm as you're talking I'm thinking oh I have that court paper thing printed out on wanting to get my name changed <laughs> maybe I should make an appointment <laughs> before I do that but we definitely appreciate you being here to sort of give us this how to and I know this stuff is always changing so I think it's really good just to have like the me the mechanics of it sometimes and because I know sometimes we get lost in the clouds of the academics of how things shouldn't be or should be and the concepts but I think having like the real world like here's how you do it is great. What I'd like to do is to kind of help folks particularly folks in King County and in Washington and a little bit about some of the federal processes be able to engage with these judges and medical providers who have been set up by the system as gatekeepers in a way that they are going to understand what you need and feel like when you approach them you in your hands you know the piece of paper that tells them what they need to do and you know what your rights are and you know what your process is that you have to go through so that you're not relying on as much on them to, you know, on those sort of gatekeepers who don't know you necessarily and who may feel kind of scary and not people that you want in your life on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to talk to them and get what you need from them. That's my main objective in doing this work is helping people go through these, these processes in a way that is going to minimize conflict. So on that note, I just want to, we're going to be starting kind of the more informational piece around these things, but how we've organized today is just so that people can kind of, you know, get a feel for things as we move on is that we're going to go over a lot of state and county local documents. So that includes like driver's license and things like that. At least point people in the right direction if you're not in Washington as to where you might find this information that's specific to your state or county. Uh, but we're also going to go over federal documents so like social security, passports. And then I also have a, a frequently asked questions um, throughout this process, both me navigating these systems as well as just you know having conversations in the community there's a lot of questions about the order of things you know what are the pros and cons of doing this or that so we'll try to hit those as well to wrap things up the first topic is going to be around changing your legal name here in the state of washington and we'll also talk about financial assistance around that too and what that looks like in the state of washington and i'm, I'm actually going to speak specifically to king county because each county in washington has i feel like fairly parallel but slightly different processes for these things. In King County, you can change your name in district court. You fill out a set of specific forms. They're available online on the King County District Court webpage. Fill out the petition, and the petition asks a series of questions, things like, I am not changing this, you know, I'm not changing my name for the purpose of fraud. I, you also have to say that you're not a, a registered sex offender. And then they also ask for the reason for your name change. There are a lot of ways that you can fill that out. Um, you can write, if you're transitioning gender, you can write that. You can write gender change. You can also write personal preference if that's something that, that feels better. In, in Washington, I will say the judges that I have encountered and heard about are, are largely actually worried about fraud. They don't consider themselves gatekeepers of gender. So they're not people who are going to be looking at you and saying, well, do you fit my vision of a person with this name or that name? They're just interested in making sure that this is something that is legally supportable in the sort of you're not you're not trying to evade something else call the legal clinic if you have a bad experience because we need to know about that in part because we can do judicial education that's the benefit of that access i was talking about earlier that we you know as attorneys can do trainings with judges and have done trainings in the court systems to help alleviate some of train some of our friends on the bench as to how to treat queer and trans folks well. So when you fill out the petition, you check off the boxes. It's a one-page petition. You present it to the clerk at district court, and there is a fee associated with it. Altogether, it comes to about $150, and there's a very helpful one-page procedural breakdown that comes with the petition online um, that tells you exactly what each of those things goes for. To waive the fee, you can ask for a motion for waiver of fees. That usually involves filling out a brief financial declaration to determine your percentage of the federal poverty level. 
That's how those things are decided. And generally that's something that gets presented either prior to or with the petition for name change. You have a hearing the same day or the next day. Generally speaking, the clerk will tell you depending on what their, their capacity is. And then you present your petition to the judge. There's also a proposed order that um, you fill out ahead of time that is another one page sheet that says essentially the same things as the petition, right? The way that the court system generally works is you have to ask via a petition or a motion for something. And then there's the order, which is the court saying, yes, I grant whatever it is you asked for in the petition or the motion. So they're generally fairly reflective documents, but one is what gets signed by the judge and you walk away with. And you know the other is the first, the petition or the motion is what you're asking them to do. And so you present those pieces of paper to the judge. They generally ask because they want you to say under oath the answers to some of those questions that are on the petition. And again, you know, generally it's fraud. It's you saying under oath, I am not doing this to defraud someone um, or to evade debts or the, that kind of a thing. It's largely a financial concern. The judge signs the order and you file that order with the clerk and get at least one certified copy because the certified copy is what you carry with you to all of these other institutions that you're going to be asking to change your name with, they're going to be looking for the certified copy of the court order. And that's also true actually with the, the gender marker petitions that and order from the court that I'll be talking about in a little bit. You know, this is the first gatekeeper I was sort of talking about, or one of the gatekeepers is the judges, right? You need a court order signed by a judge in order to do lots of other things. Some thoughts on the process are that the district court filing process, those documents can be available online and they are often not sealed. It is fairly difficult to get court records sealed in King County for lots of reasons that are sort of interesting and historical <laughs> and that I can go into it at some other time. It is something to know that it's not gonna be necessarily available on Google. So if you put in you know, your original name, it's not, necessarily going to pop up as here's a court petition saying you know your current name used to be your original name but there are lots of sort of private aggregators of court records these days available online and there's very little control over what comes up in them and so that can be difficult for folks who are not open about the process that they're going through it can come up on ECR depending on what court you're doing it in and whether that court uses the ECR system. So it's something to think about. ECR is electronic court records. King County has a civil electronic court records database as well. And so that's if you are someone who is in a situation that would be characterized as a domestic violence situation, you can obtain a court sealed name change. I would consult an attorney in doing that and it goes through the King County Superior Court so it's a little bit of a different process but I did want to put that out there as as available that there are a lot of reasons that people want to change their names and and that's one way to do it so when I talk about sealing a court record it means that once the court documents are finished like once they're filed with the clerk they go into a private file in the clerk's office and you need a court order in order to unseal them meaning to open up the file again so if I was to obtain, you know, if you're if you're obtaining a, a sealed name change, no one would be able to see the documents related to that name change unless they petition the court and could state a reason that passed the court's muster, which is a fairly high line, you know, a fairly high bar for people to 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 meet in order to see those court documents. There are a few processes that are sealed. Adoptions, for example, in King County are automatically sealed. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more in a few minutes about healthcare records and financial records. Those are also can be sealed. A couple of other thoughts about the district court name change process um, is that if you are in prison, you can also, you can still do the name change process. You have to obtain p permission from the Department of Corrections ahead of time, but you can do it, which I you know, know can be very important to folks. It is possible to get a common law name change in Washington. Basically, you, you, when you use a, a name for a particular period of time and you've got ongoing use, you can just draft an affidavit swearing that you use the name. I wouldn't recommend doing that in this particular situation because this is such a gatekeeping mechanism. These are documents that you're gonna have, you know, you're gonna have to be able to produce in lots of other circumstances and to lots of other institutions institutions and they're not going to want your affidavit. They need something from the judge. They need something from a court. And so if you're someone who isn't going to go through those other processes or doesn't want to go through those processes now, you can do that. It's a procedure that doesn't, you know, it's not, it's, it's only, it has limited use. It's actually meant more for folks who are changing names for, you know, 
marriage reasons and things like that and just don't bother to go through the, the court order process. One of the benefits of name changes is that because they're frequently done for people for all kinds of reasons, it's actually a little bit more accessible information and it's a little bit of a, of a more straightforward process because so many people do it. Actually, talked to my HR about name change and she was ta started talking about people that had, been, had changed their name for marriages mm -hmm. or divorces and like their process and just sort of viewed it as the same. and. I'm like, that's such a hetero cis normative thing. But on the other hand, it's kind of nice that topic of name change wasn't like new and different to her. I did go through this process here in Washington. So I have a few <laughs> tidbits as far as convenience that I found along the way. The first thing I want to talk about is, especially if you're living in King County or like more specifically Seattle, the downtown court that you do this at is not as convenient as I would like it to be because basically they take the petitions, the, the filing of the paperwork early in the morning and there's like a three hour gap before you actually get to talk to the judge. So it's basically a whole day process. So if you know, you're worried about school or work and all of these other factors. So I went to the North one, I think it, I believe it's Northgate and there they basically have their, their time limit. It bumps right up against going to the, to see the judge. So you can go at like, I think the cutoff is three. So you can go at like, 2.30 and do the, the documents and then just wait a half an hour to see the judge. Uh, my experience with the judge and that whole process, I did have to stand up and they ask you the questions at that particular court. They ask you the questions that you signed, you know, uh, that was already, we already spoke about around fraud uh, and other things. And then they just say, well, I actually had a really good experience. My judge was like, congratulations. I did put that I was doing it for uh, transition gender change. And she like, well, she's like, welcome to, you know, your new name and like whatever. She was really, really supportive. So I had a really great experience. The other thing that I would recommend that I did uh, for folks out there is to obtain a f couple copies of the documents. It it's cheaper to do it, I think, when you first get the name change. It's not that expensive, but you know, money is different. Is a different place for, we're all in different places around that, but especially if you have to go into all of these different financial institutions, like changing your name on your bank account and credit cards or anything like that, they all will want either a copy or to see the actual, like to, like the real document. I did have a one problem with one of the credit cards that was like, we can't, through the facts, we can't see that it's actually certified. So I would get one or two copies. I haven't had to show it very often, but it's been, you know, it would have been a lot harder to do a lot of these things without that. The credit cards and bank institutions actually are a particular frustration for me because I find that they do ask for really sometimes very, very intense paperwork, like the original of a, you know, an original certified copy. And I'm like, well, why on earth do you need the, you know, it, it, the only difference is that the stamp is like colored as opposed to, you know, being a photocopy, but who goes to the trouble to doctor a certified copy? Right? I mean, I guess people do, but they, do, it's, but yes, I, I think that that's actually a, a very good idea to get a couple of certified copies and put one in a safe place. Actually, partner being trans has a fireproof box, actually. All of the, you know, we have an original of everything. Perhaps we're overcautious. I hope we're overcautious because I don't want our house to burn down. But. The other thing I wanted to actually just uh, put out there is on our website, if you live in south if you live in the southern puget sound area there is on our website there is a, a link to the name change assistance so if you live down there 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 are some financial resources to help with this process as well if you don't qualify for the income level that we already talked about i didn't know about that is that's that's fantastic i'm glad to hear that yeah i think that's the gender alliance of the south sound so i think they cover pierce and probably thurston counties tacoma and olympia which are the two cities just directly south of seattle the next question we had and i think you covered some of this was just if there was anything people should know before changing their name maybe just a little bit we know it varies by state a friend of mine in ohio had to put a newspaper article out and wait a week. So I know that we actually have some privilege here that it happens so so much quicker. And then maybe just a quick what to Google for listeners elsewhere who figure out where to start figuring out what their state requires. I think the easiest option is just to Google name change and then your county and state or search the county court website. Because again, this is the benefit of it being a common process is that, you know, there's there's specific systems that each jurisdiction has come up with to deal with this. And, and they're generally pretty easy because, you know, of people having to do it so frequently and maybe people who have a lot of, you know, het privilege, bellyache more to the courts about how quickly things take <laughs> or how long it takes to do things. But, um, but it's, it, it's generally pretty easily findable and generally a straightforward process. But again, you know, I know sometimes paperwork can be very intimidating and it can feel very scary to check one box versus another box and what's the ease with legal language and not knowing what the implications are sometimes. Some people are 
totally golden. It's not a problem. And other folks, it's a very difficult process. So it's one of the reasons that we do support folks with this paperwork in the clinic. And I would say, you know, we actually have a goal of being able to, right now we cannot do long, long-term long representation. Um, we can do the 30-minute consultations. People can come back as many times as they want. So we can, you know, advise on what to do first, and then you go home and you fill out the paperwork and come back the next month, and we, you know, make sure the paperwork is correct. What we can't do at this point is, like, walk with folks to court to do this and some of these other order issues. We would like to be able to do that in the future. Um, some folks are, there's actually a couple of name change um, and, and gender change clinics that have developed in uh, New York. I think the Sylvia Rivera Law Project started one. And I think that there's one that I just read about and I, I believe it's DC, but I'm not positive. And so there's good models out there and we'd like to be able to, for the GLBT Legal Clinic here in King County, be able to develop that. It's not in our capacity right now, but we encourage folks to get involved, help out with that if they, if they want to, because I think that that I see is actually being a need that I'm hearing from folks that, great, I have the paperwork, an attorney looked at the paperwork, I'm going to go by myself to the court and who knows what the judge is going to say. And it can feel very scary. And I've walked with folks in my own private practice through that process and gone with them to court and been able to do that. But on the legal clinic end of things, we don't have that capacity yet. One other small tidbit or nugget, as I've decided to use, <laughs> I <experience laughs> that I was annoyed with is just to make sure that you bring cash or checks. They don't take credit cards. And it's such a bummer to go there and be ready to do everything. They're like, sorry. And if you're close to the time limit, it'll be another day. I think the next thing we're going to start to kind of move into is the required documents for name change and uh, sex marker change on your driver's license. And again, we're going to be talking about Washington State, uh, but it should be, you know, something that you could easily find. And we'll try to point you to the right direction for other states. Yeah. So in Washington, um, again, this is a very easily Googleable process. You can put down your pens and, you know, <laughs> not, not worry about taking down notes. But you have to appear in person in a Department of Licensing office and you bring your name change court order or what they call a standalone document. And they've got a list of standalone documents. A passport is one of them. I would say that some of the standalone documents may be difficult to get your, your correct name on without a court order. So I think the court order is probably the best direction to go. You pay a $10 fee and they will change your name. The sex marker change is a little bit more complicated, but it actually just recently got less complicated in Washington. Yes. There's a, a few attorneys, I will give a shout out to a guy named Spencer Bergstedt, who is a, an attorney up in Snohomish County who has done a lot of advocacy on this particular issue. And so now we have a comparatively easy, <laughs> yes, easier. So there's a, a form online um, or the legal clinic has it. And I will say actually, the when you look at how to change your driver's license, this made me very happy. There's name change, address change, and gender change like right there on the website. Often these institutions, you have to kind of go burrowing for the gender change information or the sex marker change information, but this is just right there like, hey, turns out we're people. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> so there's a form that they have online. You fill out part of it and, and then you have a licensed medical physician or psychologist fill out a secondary part of it. There's that other gatekeeper. And I've had a couple of questions about whether like, for example, a naturopath could do it. Um, I think that that's a question for your healthcare provider, whomever it is, but you do have to have a medical practitioner sign off on it. And then you mail the form and a photocopy of your current driver's license to the address on the form. They send you an authorization letter. So you have to wait around a little bit for that. Once you have that authorization letter, you can make the change online or at a driver's license office. Um, again, there's a $10 fee. I would recommend that for the purposes of safety and getting other documentation that where you might need to present an ID, you can ask them to retake your pictures. Given the, the, the way that the process is laid out, I would say if you're going to do both your name change and a sex, sex marker change, you do them all together, fill in all the paperwork, have them send you the authorization letter and then just go in in person because for the name change you have to go in in person anyway and which is sort of a mysterious requirement to me but whatever if you have to go in anyway and you want to get your picture retaken you can do all of that in one visit so that you're not sort of having to revisit the institution a bunch of different times for different purposes you can kind of do it all at once i also have already done this process or i have not done the sex marker change and for me like i think we'll kind of hit some of that and the other questions I have as to like strategies around when to do that, but it was super easy. And the Department of License here, I experienced really good, competent training. Like there was no weird looks or stares. It was really comfortable and really easy. Okay. The next question is around requirements and or necessary documentation to change your name and gender marker on school transcripts, diplomas, or school registration if applying to a new school. So I'm 
assuming that this question is probably most specific to colleges, but if you want to speak and are able to speak to high school for um, our younger listeners, that would be great too. So schools can be actually a little bit complicated. In my understanding, and, and much of this information is actually taken from the Transgender Law Center's ID Please document, which I very much recommend people take a look at. It's sort of California specific, but it covers a lot of these questions. And they're generally just a fantastic organization. So yeah, so the schools are, they're, they're a little complicated. In Washington, what I will say is that schools are included in the Washington Law Against Discrimination, which includes gender identity and expression as a protected category. What that means is that if schools do name changes or sex marker changes for non-trans folks, they need to do it for everyone. So somebody gets married and the school says, sure, we'll change your last name on your transcripts, then they need to do it for everyone. It's easiest to get the school to do it, I would say. If you have the court orders for name or gender change documents, if you have those court orders already, there's something about the power of a document that is signed by a judge and has the fancy pleading paper, you know, with the name of the court on the top and all of that business that sometimes makes people feel more compelled to do things. But generally speaking, it's it's very dependent on what the school's individual policies are. And I will also add that in Washington, not just colleges, but also high schools and elementary schools are included in the Washington Law Against Discrimination's coverage, which has been very good for things like bullying and restroom respect, actually also in Washington schools, uh, but also means that if the schools are doing, you know, they have to treat people equally in, in school records and transcripts. Um, if you're having trouble with the school, sometimes an attorney drafted letter can help. The clinic can help you draft that letter. We can't sort of sign off on it because of our representation limitations to the, you know, being limited to the consultation context. Sometimes having that language, you know, knowing those magic phrases or the magic words and dropping, you know, RCW 4960, the Washington Law Against Discrimination, suddenly officials look at that and they're like, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. Guess we should stop messing with them. <laughs> so I would say if you're having trouble, definitely reach out to the legal clinic here in King County or reach out to attorneys or legal services in your area because just having that language can often help get you going. The one thing that I do want to add to this is, is something that I'm currently experiencing is even the schools are not required to, if, especially if you haven't legally changed your sex marker, they are not required to hide it or keep it from students. So even at University of Washington, teachers get the roster with my legal name, but also my legal sex marker and published documents around student ID and or name can still affiliate that. So if you are someone that really wants to protect identifiers, that it's something that you may run, run up against if you don't have it legally changed, but they're not obligated to do any of that, even though we live in Washington and there's this, there's this protection. Yet again, one of the things we don't need gender documented by, I mean, unless you were living in the dorm, I know that they sex segregate dorms. Why does your teacher... Rawr. Okay. <laughs> Just kind of a follow-up to transcripts and working with schools. What are the obligations for schools in regards to how they reveal your name and sex marker to other institutions, whether it's going to be a graduate school moving from bachelor's or high school into college? Like, As far as reporting to other institutions, what does that look like? There aren't legal obligations that I'm aware of. In, they could be different in different states, but my understanding is it's sort of just a general school policy issue of what they kick forward. I'm actually surprised to hear your experience with the University of Washington because that's a little bit more information than I had expected them to forward necessarily. And I'm sure that they have institutional reasons. And so if you're somebody affiliated with the University of Washington, please don't get mad at me. I'm just curious. <laughs> But I'm not aware of any legal obligations in terms of how that information gets forwarded. Now, again, we're talking about unsealed records. If you have a situation where sealing through your individual jurisdiction is available to you, being able to sort of put your original name in a vault once you get that court order, that your situation may look different and the school's obligations may look different. In Washington, I would say if you've got Again, a domestic violence situation appears in my research to be the line that they're drawing that, you know, they may have different obligations about that. But it can also be very fact specific about what your school's policies are and what your ability is to advocate within those policies for what you've got. So again, you know, coming into the legal clinic or to accessing some some legal advice in your own jurisdiction in your own area can be really helpful. If you come in and you bring this policy and you say, well, this is what my school's policy is. What's my wiggle room here? What's my leverage? How can I get them to do what I need them to do? You know, you may, you may have a different experience and be able to, with a little bit of advocacy, get what you need from it. I guess I will check in with our listeners at a later date as I move forward with school. This question 
question or I had this a question in there because I just even recently experienced, even though I went through the process of changing my transcripts to have my legal name only on there, when I went to talk to the Office of Admissions about receiving a transcript, they said we couldn't find anything under your previous name or your new name. So I was surprised that they got that because it's not in any of my application or process or any of that. So I will update you with uh, what I find. And I know we're talking about some areas where Sean has privilege in being able to go to school. And I know I was recently in a conversation with someone who was on social security benefits and was really struggling around gender marker changes with being able to receive benefits. They were on like disability benefits. So I know the next block that we're moving into is sort of our federal national block, but maybe we can speak to like public entitlements. And I think schools are one area where it happens, but I think it happens in other areas too around, you know, just sort of navigating that. And I mean, homeless shelters are sex segregated and I, based on the shelter that you go, I know there's some here locally that let you self-identify. And I know there's others where you have to produce a, you know, a piece of identification and it's whatever that says. So the other thing that I'm really disturbed by is if you're on probation and you have to get a UA who observes you taking that UA <laughs> and some of the companies here locally in in King County go by genitalia which is really 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 disturbing so if anybody has experiences out there that they want to write in about I have a friend that actually works in a mental health program where they serve people that are under court jurisdiction or on probation and they they were talking to me about it. It's a trans person that was talking to me about it. So there's all kinds of areas where this gets sticky and gross. By UA, I mean a urinalysis. So it's when you have to have an observed, you have to pee in front of somebody observing you so that your pee can be tested for drugs, having drugs or other substances, alcohol or other drug substances. I just wanted to add that that is not an area that is exempt from certain kinds of legal protection and certain kinds of legal rights. I, you know, without knowing more about the fact situations, I can't really speak to what is legal and illegal behavior by people administering those tests. But I would say that, especially when you have a free clinic here in Seattle or in here in King County, it's worth talking to somebody about if you have an experience that feels that doesn't work for you or that feels invasive, it's worth talking to an attorney just to find out like, was that legal? And if not, what do I do? What are my options? You don't have to do anything about it if it feels like too much, but it's worth knowing, in my opinion, I mean, everybody's experience is different and I've never, I've had the fortune to not feel violated during a urinalysis, but wouldn't necessarily assume that what happens there, no matter what context you're in, is outside the law. Getting to a place where people are able to self-identify. You know, like for me, being assigned female birth and thinking about having to do a UA, I probably would want a female observing me, but who knows? Maybe Sean wouldn't want that or maybe he would. I mean, I think it just depends and I think every person is different and the need to have more room for self-identification and not sort of this strict thing. I mean, it's an amazing to think about because I remember when I was talking about it with my colleague, I was like, huh, I wonder how I would, what I would do in that situation. Anyway, we digress. So let's get back to the next question, which is what are the requirements and necessary documentation to change your name on your passport? I know passports are a big deal. How do you change your gender marker on your passport? And how does last year's legislation affect folks today? And how does that contrast in comparison with the law prior to 2011? So there were some passport changes in, in March of 2011. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, one thing I will say is that the National Center for Transgender Equality has a fantastic guide on passport changes. And actually, so most of the information I'm pulling from that I'm, I'm giving, I'm pulling from there. And that's also available online on their site. Generally, the process is you want to use the DS-5504 form. I love the federal government. Everything's like, let me give you six letters and seven numbers to identify this document. And heaven forbid you get it wrong because you will be in absolutely the wrong place. So the DS-5504, there's a difference between getting a new passport and an amended passport, or a, it's also called a stamp over passport. What NCTE, the National Center for Transgender Equality, advocates for is getting a new passport. It's a kind of a little bit more of a hassle. You've got to do the whole application again, but it's another 10-year passport as opposed to an amended two-year passport and it has all of the new information it doesn't just have the stamp over it's not just like a you know x out whatever previous information there was and write in you know new information you don't want to do the wrong thing and end up with a document that is only 
marginally more helpful maybe than it was before, potentially even less. So with the name change, what they require is a court order or records documenting five-year use of a new name. Again, the court order, because you've got to get it for so many other things, you might as well use it for that. Unless you've got, for whatever your situation is, records documenting five-year use of, of the correct name. For the gender designation, you need to present them with a photo representing your current appearance and an ID representing your current appearance. So this is going back to what we were talking about with the driver's license issue in Washington, that it can be helpful to get a, your picture retaken so that you can present an ID that's not going to get you hassled <laughs> by the passport agency. There's also a physician certificate. NCTE's document has the exact language that they recommend that you use. Some of the magic words are that if you if you get the temporary two-year passport, your physician's certificate says that your gender transition is in process. If your physician is willing to say that your gender transition is complete, you can get the 10-year certificate. So that's something that can be an important distinction. You know, I know I was saying earlier, get the 10-year if you can. And I still think that that's the case. But if you're someone whose healthcare provider won't for whatever reason, either because of where you are with your transition or for other, uh, whatever their other reasons maybe, isn't willing to say that your gender transition is complete, that it is still in process. If you're in the middle of transition. I know it's 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 Gross. it's icky. It feels so invasive and I feel so invasive talking about it, especially as somebody who's not trans, right? I'm like, so, you know, when you do this, you just do this process and it's, you know, whatever. You fill out this form and, you know, just talk to your doctor, right? But it's not that easy, you know. And so I I, I want to acknowledge that I feel icky talking about it, and I'm sorry that I have to talk about these things. Forgive me. <laughs> Glad you talked to me about it. Thank you. I appreciate that. So if you're somebody who's new, who's newly transitioned or identifies as genderqueer in such a way that, you know, your physician is never going to think you're complete, <laughs> you've got to fly to France for whatever, or, you know, go home and visit family in, you know, South America, or whatever it is that you need your passport for, you can get that two-year stamp of our passport if that's what, what works for you. The physician statement has to be on signed original letterhead from your physician, and it has to be a physician who has knowledge of your gender transition treatment. This is another one of those gatekeeping things that I have a really hard time with because it, especially in the United States where we have such a deeply flawed healthcare system, just going to your doctor and getting a note can be a huge barrier. At best, you're talking about copays. At worst, you're talking about trying to access some public health care provider who's going to be willing to say these things mm -hmm. on your behalf. And that is a huge, huge issue. I really struggle with that. You know, and I struggle with that in sort of a, you know, in, in sort of an impotent way, because as attorneys, we don't have a great deal of clout with the State Department <laughs> in changing their policies. Someone has clout with the State Department because there has been a really significant rollback in the requirements for passport changes. Um, and that was the change between 2011 and now, that it used to be a, a requirement of gender surgery or sex reassignment surgery. And the fact that now it's just appropriate clinical treatment and the State Department is really deferring to medical practitioners to decide what that is, that represents a pretty major step for the institution understanding kind of what is we're doing exactly. Have you seen examples where that was only hormone therapy? Anecdotally, yes. I actually I haven't gone through this process yet, but I have a signed letter waiting for the day that I'm ready to do this that just basically says that I've, I'm in the, pro like, not in the process, but that I've transitioned and I have not had surgery yet. What's so impactful is it takes a lot of folks a lot of time to afford surgery where we usually have a little bit more access around hormone therapy. And so this is a significant change, especially in the fact that this is a standalone document as far as for employers and stuff like that. So it is an easy document in regards to changing that marker. Because I, I from my understanding, I believe that some states, and I was going to ask you about this too, like even in Washington with the driver's license, what does that letter from your medical provider look like to get the sex marker changed on your driver's license? Is it just an agreement like the passport as far as that you've transitioned or that you're in the medical transition versus surgery or is surgery still required for our driver's license sex marker change? So I'm glad you asked that. Um, that's a that's a good point to make. So I'm, I'm actually looking at the department, Washington State Department of Licensing gender designation request form and your physician has to check off, I am the attending physician with a doctor-patient relationship with the applicant, yes or no. I've reviewed and evaluated the applicant's medical history, yes or no. The applicant has undergone the appropriate gender transition clinical treatment, yes or no. What is the gender identification of this applicant, male or female? You know, it's easy to see where there's problems there. There's sort of, there's a few magic phrases that pop up pretty frequently, and one of them is appropriate clinical treatment. And that, again, is sort of a representative of this, the institution sort of deferring or punting, <laughs> however you want to look at it, 
to medical practitioners to make these decisions. I'm sure you all know more about this than than I do, having gone to the the Philly Trans Health Conference recently, that there is really great advocacy happening in the medical community to really understanding the difference between standards of care that somebody else imposes versus informed consent and what those different things look like. Again, it really depends on your medical provider. And I know folks in... I know, folks, you two are so funny fighting over the mic. I am going to hold it. (laughs) The mic is mine. (laughs) But I do think, you know, think that even in King County, even in Seattle, I hear from folks having, you know, just anecdotally from folks having terrible experiences with doctors. You know, I will say that I, with my own medical provider at Group Health, here's what I need you to do if you're going to serve me. You know, here's what the the information I need you to know if you're going to serve me in terms of the community that I live in. And then was really proactive about who can I refer people to? Hey, I have all these people in my community who need these, need help and need medical care. Who can I send them to that that's going to be, you know, respectful? And I know we all know horror stories. I don't ever want to send someone to a doctor to have a horror story. That's awful. So the one thing I did want to clear up, because I think sometimes we, getting back to our Original days where Jesse uh, was no ho, the no ho, no op. <laughs> For folks that are seeing, say, would it be appropriate or would this documentation still coincide if you were seeing, say, a mental health therapist, but we're not planning to do any kind of hormones or not planning any surgeries? Could you still get your gender marker changed on these documents, having, like, say, a mental health provider sign off saying that? You're doing that. So while you're looking for that, (laughs) this is making me think a lot about when we did the episode on informed consent. And one of the things that we talked about in that episode was trans competent healthcare. And, you know, in the episode, really the focus was around access to trans health. So access to hormones, access to surgery. We didn't talk as much about identity documents, but as I'm thinking about the sort of movement within Seattle about people becoming more trans competent, both mental health and medical providers, I really do think that this is like a critical area around talking with our medical providers for how they're going to weigh in on this. I think I have the court documents sitting on my desk at work. And really all I want to do is abbreviate my name to a different version, but I've sort of been putting it off. And just as you're reading that, I'm like, oh yeah, all that stuff I had to fill out. But I do think if you get to a point where you're going to be doing some of these documents that not only do we want a doctor that can actually like give us hormones and manage it and understand like what we need, but actually is willing to do this piece of it too, because, you know, I can only imagine you're on hormones for so long. You're going to get to a point where people are going to see the gender you are assigned at birth on your driver's license and be like, what the hell is this? Like there's some sort of mistake. And I know people have run into that and just somebody I know that on their passport had everything changed, but not their gender marker. And it was like a little, it was, it was a little sticky sort of navigating travel. So I think as part of trans competent healthcare providers, that this is something as you're going in and talk with, talking with your provider that we might want to be thinking about more so. We didn't put as much emphasis on it in that episode. But as I'm hearing you talk, I'm like, wow, this is really critical that doctors are, because that's like three or four documents already that you've talked about them having to sign off and provide letters for. It is a difficult gate to have to walk through. The Washington Department of Licensing, they actually have a long list on this form of, of different types of medical providers that you can be seeing. Medical physician, internist, endocrinologist, gynecologist, urologist, osteopath, psychiatrist, or psychologist. And I should note, actually, that if you're getting an enhanced driver's license, which is, I think, the fancy one that lets you go into Canada, that the requirement is is difficult. Oh, and actually, I have an answer to my question or to my issue earlier. Um, about nurse practitioners. So nurse practitioners, health practitioners, naturopaths, and chiropractors are not physicians. So I think I had said anecdotally something about a naturopath earlier. I'm glad I read the form, which is also sort of interesting in terms of Western medicine versus, you know, other kinds of of medical care and interactions with your body, you know, that, that comes into play here. So mental health providers will be able to sign off on a driver's license. Right, but only PhD level. The State Department's instructions are not quite as clear, and I confess that some of this is my own lack of knowledge, but they need to have a medical license or certificate number, issuing state of medical license or certificate, and a Drug Enforcement Administration registration number. So I don't know if that limits you to a particular, so it does limit you to being an MD. I'm glad you said that though, because I know here in Seattle, and I don't know about other places, but we do have a very trans competent naturopath that serves a lot of the trans community. So I think it's critical that people are aware that even though they're getting access to trans health through that person, that they're not going to get access to 
identity documents and that they'll have to find that elsewhere. So I think the more that we procure and sort of educate our doctors and share those doctors' names and really build this here and in other places, it's just so important that we have a medical community that can help us with this stuff. So just to loop back into talking about the requirements for passport changes, NCTE's guide has a great sample letter. If you're not going to use that, make sure you've got the magic words, appropriate clinical treatment, and that your medical provider is declaring under penalty of perjury, right? That is a magic word that gets you a lot of things in the legal world, but basically means that they're, they swear they're telling the truth. They declare under penalty of perjury. And that is a very important phrase that, that is included. You don't have to say what that appropriate clinical treatment is. You don't have to talk about it at all. And in some ways, you know, I mean, you're certainly welcome to, but there's no reason to tell the State Department what your your medical stuff is. I think sometimes in our community we get so used to having to prove ourselves in those way that, ways that we forget that we don't have to tell all these gatekeepers all of this very deeply personal information in order to be believed. That's And that's one of the reasons that I think that these sort of magic phrases of the appropriate clinical treatment is a, is a good overall development because it takes out some of that very personal stuff. And one thing to note is that NCT is actually specifically monitoring appropriate treatment by State Department officials. They've gotten training on using correct pronouns and treating people respectfully. There's always outliers, right? I mean, there was just recently a very high profile case in San Francisco where a trans person was abhorrently treat treated by a DMV employee. And I was like, San Francisco? I mean, come on. The DMV employees in San Francisco see everybody. And this person, they get all kinds of training. It's very, it's a very proactive place. And it was still happening. So it's, so NCTE wants to know about that. Um, and additionally, if you experience harassment or persecution abroad because of gender identity or related to your passport documents, you can notify your U.S. consulate or embassy. That is also something that NCTE is recommending in that publication and that it didn't occur to me that one might actually do. <laughs> you know, that, that might actually be a safe option. NCT is not a, a legal organization by definition, but they are a policy and advocacy organization and they do they do fantastic work. And so they want to know if you're if you're having trouble with this because they're in a position where they've they're trying they're hoping to do something about it. So I think the golden rule is to as Jesse already kinda of talked about, is to be your advocate. So don't be afraid. Even if this provider sees a medical provider or a mental health provider sees a lot of patients, they may not know the latest legislation and they may not know to where to go to print off that magic wording document they have to sign off on. So it's always awesome to go in, paper in hand, and be like, sign here, please, because it, it could be something that varies. Yeah, I would say that, you know, in best case scenarios, that's true with medical providers and with judges, right? They would just want to see the right paperwork. Mm -hmm. They want to see something that they can put their name on and know that it's consistent and they understand what they're doing. And for the most part, what I have seen, at least in King County, is that People are not, in the legal community in particular, they're not interested in, in making a point. They just want to sign a form. They want to do the right thing for you. And what they can do in their position sitting on the bench in the black robe is sign a form. And they want to know that it's the right form. So if you can give them the right form, they're going to sign it. So moving on to the next lovely document that we have on the list, birth certificates. Um, I know this varies a lot by state. and There's a lot of different procedures you have to go through depending on where you live. But here in Washington, where if you were born in Washington, not if you live in Washington, but if you were born in Washington, how would you go about changing your name and or gender on your birth certificate? I'm glad you actually made the distinction between born in Washington versus live in Washington because you can get a Washington court order that can compel whatever your birth state is to change your birth certificate. And it depends on what the statute is in your birth state, what your birth state requires in terms of what that magic, what those magic words are that, that the order from the court has to say. But you don't have to, for example, if you're born in Alabama, fly back to Alabama and see an Alabama judge to get your birth certificate changed. Um, you can get a court order in Washington, then follow the process with that. But, you know, the court order can come from here. To change the name in Washington, if you're, so I'm talking about changing a Washington birth certificate. Lambda Legal did a great publication pulling together the different statutory requirements for the 50 states. I also recently got asked about a birth certificate issued by the State Department for a birth abroad. There's actually a process very similar to the states, but to, to change one of those birth certificates. That Lambda publication will help you know what the statute is that has been generated in, in your home state, what it asks you to do, what the magic words are they need to see. Some states, they do require sex reassignment surgery, or they require an order saying you've had sex reassignment surgery. Some just have the appropriate clinical treatment. This is an area where 
birth certificates are an area where there hasn't been as much progress made in terms of moving away from the surgical sort of intervention model. So to change your name in Washington, you send your court order to the Department of Health with a request in writing, the name of the identifying record, birth certificate, your date of birth, your parents' names, your place of birth, and the new name requested. To change the sex designation on the birth certificate, you have essentially the same letter, same information, including a letter, letter from a medical or osteopathic physician with that appropriate clinical treatment language. And a couple of thoughts on that process. One is that if the Department of Health denies that change to the birth certificate, you can appeal it to court. Um, there's a statute that says that you can. Again, it's beneficial if you're going to go that route to present your name and gender change together. There are some costs associated with in terms of getting new copies of the documents, and I don't know that there's a waiver for those costs. There may be, and I encourage actually people to ask about cost waivers throughout these processes because sometimes it can just be a matter of asking. Generally, the measure is the federal poverty index. There's a lot of poverty that doesn't look like the poverty index, but it is something you can ask for. And I should have given this plug a lot earlier. The ACLU of Washington did a really great guide on legal rights for transgender people in Washington state. And so ACLU of Washington, I hope you'll forgive me for not saying this at the outright because it is a great publication and the legal clinic has lots of copies of it and the ACLU wants to give it out. Very, very, very comprehensive and has really great best practices. If you're in Washington state, that's a great place to turn for information. It's a very good, just sort of general guidebook. Between that and ID Please from the Transgender Law Center, and the National Center for Transgender Equality publications and Lambda's publications, you know, there's, there's a great deal of information from these various legal organizations, which is fantastic. When you're changing your birth certificate, um, and it's a Washington-generated birth certificate, the Washington statutes don't actually specify exactly what's required. The Department of Health has a process about this. Some states have statutes. Our state does not have statutes, but it does have a Department of Health policy. And the only place that it appears to require a court order is the court ordered name change. So it appears, in my understanding, that if you need to change your gender designation on your birth certificate, and it's a, birth, a Washington birth certificate, you send them the court ordered name change and the letter from your physician. Other states are different. Other states do require a court order. And we actually, at the legal clinic, can help fill out if you are getting that court order from a Washington court. We have some standard paperwork that we use that is the petition and order to a King County court that says, I need the court to order that my gender is changed from X to Y. In that court order goes whatever the magic language is in your birth state. So in some states, it's you know, appropriate clinical treatment. In other states, it's sex reassignment surgery. In that case, you have to present some medical certification of sex reassignment surgery. One person I, I talked to actually had a certificate from their surgeon like the on little certificate paper, <laughs> which I thought was was very interesting. That person found it charming, so I also found it charming. Other people might not feel that way, <laughs> but the courts do need to see some evidence of the sex reassignment surgery other than just your personal affidavit. It can be a letter from your physician. Letterhead is generally a good best practice. And that document can be sealed. That is a healthcare record. And so what you want to do when you go to a Washington court to get that gender change court order is um, you want to get, I believe it's GR 15, King County Court Rules. They have a cover letter for sealing healthcare records. It's, and it's fairly common because it comes up all the time in family law and all kinds of, you know, medical malpractice and all kinds of other court cases where there's medical records that get introduced into the court record. And so you just use that cover letter and you write sealed on the top of whatever document it is that you're submitting under that cover letter. And then that letter from your physician or that certificate from your physician, if your, <laughs> your physician issues certificate, that gets sealed in your file. So it's not publicly available on the court's electronic system and it's not something that, that people will be able to look at. And so that's, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And it very much depends on what your birth state's requirements are. There are a couple of states that, in my understanding, don't actually change birth certificates. Um, and some states also, also do an amended birth certificate, which okay. it depends on the state. Some states, it just means they like staple the new one on top of the old one. Sometimes it's, you know, an X out. Other times they will issue an entirely new certificate. It was surprising to me in reviewing the list of states that Lambda Legal has, what states have which policies. Um, states that I would expect to be very conservative actually have, have a policy where they issue a completely new birth certificate, which I thought was 
fairly progressive. That's something to keep in mind when you're when you're looking at it. The birth certificate document is actually an interesting one because it's one that, you know, I get asked a lot, like, do I need to change my birth certificate? And again, that's a question that you have to kind of ask about your own specific situation. It is, in some cases, a document that, for example, you can use to support a passport change that can be presented when you're applying for a passport as, you know, they need all those sort of secondary verifications of identity and that that is one. The other more common thing I see is there's some like school and financial institution requirements and it depends very much on what those schools or financial institutions ask. The other common one is marriage. Some jurisdictions when you want to get married have a birth certificate requirement so that if one person has a birth certificate that says M and the other one has a birth certificate that says F, you're pretty much good to go. And actually, I just recently learned that there was a good result in New York where this is another sort of example of, of gatekeepers, right, where clerks in the courts can sometimes, you know, when they're performing marriages, can sometimes be put in interesting positions and have some power to make decisions about people's lives and what they're able to do with people's lives. In New York, they had a situation develop that I sort of heard about anecdotally where a clerk saw people that they didn't think conformed to, this is before New York legalized same-sex marriage, um, that they didn't think conformed to the M and the F, even though they had documentation that said they they were, you know, M and F. So there was a good result there where, you know, they essentially had a resulted in, I believe, a settlement that said, nope, this is actually not your job. Your job is to evaluate the documents, not the people. Anecdotally, I've also heard very positive stories where, you know, people at different stages of identity and transition have come in and been successfully married because they've got those two documents, one says M, one says F. Some jurisdictions don't actually ask for birth certificates. Hawaii, for example, you just need a driver's license. It's a big destination wedding location. So, you know, you don't want distraught brides who left their birth certificate home in Iowa or wherever, you know, <laughs> going to Hawaii. I came all this way <laughs> and I'm not really married. So some, some jurisdictions only ask for driver's licenses, which can be good because it's you know, a somewhat less burdensome process. That's the other big reason to do the birth certificate change is if you want to get married and your your jurisdiction says you need a birth certificate and you don't have the funds or the desire to fly to Hawaii, <laughs> then you can get the, the court order change. And some people just like uniformity. You know, they just want it all sort of taken care of, spend a year and, you know, a couple hundred bucks of hassle and then come out at the other end with everything that you hope you will ever need. So one thing I just wanted to add is that we've used this term sexual reassignment surgery often, and this is a, an instance, again, where it's good to have a conversation with your medical provider as to what they deem that is. Some folks are going to insist and or have the opinion that reassignment surgery means lower slash bottom slash genital surgery. Some are going to be suffice with just top surgery, chest surgery, as we call it, conversation when you're picking your primary care providers. The other thing I wanted to go back to, um, and I forgot about this because I had heard this about Washington, is that in the, the sealing process, when you're changing your driver's license, I heard that you can pay like, I don't know, an extra fee to have your driver's license sealed so that if you had moving violations or whatever that deemed your old name and or gender that it could be sealed so they couldn't see. And I, I don't know if you have knowledge about that because this wasn't in our kind of prepared topics. It might be something that we are able to do here in Washington. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's interesting. I hope that they do that. That would be great. Because again, I think that, you know, one of the things that can be frustrating about this process is as there's more and more private aggregators of data, it's harder and harder to control what gets seen and what information is out there. And I know that that can feel very, very invasive. My partner recently got, I think, an ad in the mail addressed to his old name that he hasn't used for, like, I don't know, 12 years. Oh. And it was, it was really intense. And I've also talked to folks who are really concerned about their safety for various reasons. And they say, well, I Googled myself and this old name is kicking around and it's linked to my new name. And so that's, you know, those are things to, to think about. The other thing is employers are increasingly Googling people, which as an employment attorney in my sort of full-time life, I have some feelings about. But I think that it, it's useful to Google oneself on a regular basis and just see what's out there. And, you know, and it can be useful just as sort of a life practice generally. And, and maybe I'm stepping into the weeds a little bit, giving other people advice about life practices. But from the legal perspective, I do often counsel people to sort of develop, you know, an elevator speech, develop a script for yourself to answer problematic or invasive questions about these things, because it as sort of a survival strategy, because 
when you feel put on the spot and you feel nervous and you feel like, you know, something major in your life is on the line, you know, your new boss is talking to you, you're standing in front of a TSA agent who's looking at a document, like, what is it that you want to say? And can you have something kind of at the ready so that you know, and those might be slightly different things depending on whom it is. I, I would very much recommend it with employers in particular, because employers generally, they're looking for certain things, you know, and we can talk about that a little bit. I think we have some, another question about what the impact of these documents are on other things in your life. But I would say in, with employers in particular, it can be helpful to two sentences that are sort of two disarming, basically informative sentences that that can kind of give people enough information to know that they don't need to worry about getting any more information. Yeah. You know, yes, I heard that you had this Google result about me. Here's the process, you know, here's what happened or, you know, whatever you want that to be. You can be open about it or it can be something that is truthful enough to be truthful, but not actually informative about what your background is. Of course, I would never advocate for someone to lie to their employer <laughs> because that is a big problem. But I do think that it's useful to kind of, you know, be ready to think about those things. Know what your own Google results are um, and know what's out there. And some of those companies, you know, some of the private companies you can contact and say, this needs to go away. And I have heard of people having some success with that. I feel like it can kind of feel like a whack-a-mole kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you do one and then another one pops up. And I wish that there was a way to just sort of send some ping out into the universe that says, stop, <laughs> you know, like until somebody develops that, it is sort of a, a difficult thing. And it's just better to know what's out there than to be surprised. The other thing I want to just add to that quickly, as far as keeping things separate, especially as you're looking to, as you know, even if you go through this process of changing your name and your gender mark and you do all this stuff, is also to keep in mind emails. I know that sometimes employers Google your email or they have their certain databases that they can go and then everything is linked. So especially with a lot of folks vlogging about their transition and their name has changed or their Facebook name has changed, if it's still linked to that old email, it's going to come up. Or if you're an activist and you're very out to your community about being trans but need to like for whatever reasons for protection or just personal preference you want to keep that separate from your school or your work create a separate email account and with a different server i would i would recommend a different service altogether so if you have a gmail account use yahoo because a lot of the times they want to link and oh google plus connect everything but if you're trying to have a very separate interaction with certain communities and have another interaction and be out in certain communities then to try to really privatize those things you know don't maybe don't use your full name use your like right now i use my first and middle name so that people can't find my employment stuff they couldn't google that so that's also something to keep in mind with all of the media we have so i think we'll move on to the last question we have around federal and national stuff so what are the requirements or necessary documentation to change your name and gender marker on your social security card yeah we may have talked about this a little bit but just procedurally the process is that for your name you have a document supporting your new name and your old name. It could be an affidavit and not a court order, but in this situation, I think a court order is probably best because of sort of the heightened scrutiny that queer and trans folks can experience in these processes. I'm a middle namer, right? My first name is, is Jennifer, and so I actually at one point had to change my social security card. Obviously, looking at somebody changing from Jennifer to Denise is going to look very different than somebody changing from, you know, Jennifer to... Michael. Again, you know, you could do the affidavit route. It's just a cost-benefit analysis of what kinds of interactions you want to be having with these systems. For the sex designation or the gender marker, you need to submit the changed birth certificate and a letter from your surgeon. It's not entirely clear whether the letter needs to needs to reference sex reassignment surgery. Obviously, if your birth certificate doesn't require sex reassignment surgery, maybe it it doesn't. And so but that's that's sort of the general process is just some sort of document that supports the identity. And the interesting thing about the social security card marker, it's, that's sort of a an interesting employment impact, right? Sometimes people can be outed when their employer gets a no match letter, which is really, to me, actually, and again, I was talking earlier about sort of holistic legal perspectives and thinking about the ways that the law and various movements can sort of impact each other. There's some partnership possibility with the trans and queer rights movements and immigration rights movements, right? Because a lot of these sort of social security and very intense identity 
document, them becoming more strict or more scrutinized has a lot to do with anti-immigration sentiment, political moves towards more regulating workers and regulating people in general and a great deal of suspicion and discrimination against people who have documents that are not issued by the United States, <laughs> right? All kinds of borders at work here. And so I think that that's an interesting sort of place of partnership that there are similar ways that queer and trans folks are being scrutinized and limited and, and sort of boxed in that also folks who are undocumented or have, you know, temporary documentation or are seeking full documentation also are being scrutinized and boxed in. And the level of surveillance happening is happening for everybody. So that's something to kind of think about in terms of your social security designation is just that, you know, it's, it's helpful to get that change so that your employer doesn't get a no match letter. And being a little bit proactive about knowing what the impact of all of these different kinds of documents are is so that you can be aware of where they might pop up, where that legal system might come to interact with you as opposed to you choosing to interact with it. And that also raises um, another question about the selective service and the draft. And there's, and I'm not gonna go into the policy about that right now, but there is some good coverage of that in the ACLU rights of transgender people. And also ID please has a good summary of what to do depending on where you are in your gender change and what direction you're going and you know where you're choosing to end up about how to do that because that is a requirement for a lot of financial aid documents and school applications for example to be able to sort of check off the box like yes i have registered for the selective service or and if you say no then you may not be eligible depending on sort of what your situation is uh women cannot be drafted is i mean we don't currently have a draft so i imagine if that we if we instituted a draft that might change despite don't ask don't tell the military folks who are sort of on the trans spectrum are generally not eligible for military service. So registering for the selective service doesn't necessarily mean that you would end up, should there be a draft, end up drafted. You know, it would more likely mean that you would be sort of bounced for other reasons within the military. It is a box you have to check, you know, when you're going for financial aid, potentially other types of benefits. I'm not necessarily directly aware of what they are right now. Know that that is also something that particularly if you're ending up somewhere on the spectrum that is going to bump you into M, <laughs> um, you're probably going to, to need to be aware of selective service. I wonder too, again, there's so many questions and it just goes and goes and goes. For folks that maybe have served and are getting veterans benefits, if they are no longer serving but still getting those be benefits and then transition, would their benefits be at risk of being cut off if they change their gender marker? I just know that the VA has taken a different approach and people are, are still eligible and they're actually supporting um, transition within the services that they provide. And so I know that there's been a lot of effort made. I know here in Seattle, the Seattle campus, the, the one on Beacon Hill, there's actually a support group for transgender veterans um, where they can participate with each other and sort of have that military culture and being trans in common if you go to the VA. So I know that there's the Department of Defense is take on it and the Veterans Affairs, the Federal Veterans Affairs Administration take on it are a little bit different. <laughs> but I would say as a trans person, I'm kind of glad that trans people aren't allowed in the military. But that all goes back to Matilda's episode where we don't want to be in the military. We want to get rid of the military altogether. But anyway, this is a more mechanical episode, I think, that's less about a social justice movement and more about like survival and how to navigate like being in the world right now. And it's true. Like, I know I mentioned my court document, but I remember when I was printing it off and filling it, I was like, geez, I've been doing this podcast for a couple years now. And I don't even feel that much more comfortable to do this really. And I can talk all day long about what's messed up with the world and like different movements we should work with actually filling out like a court paperwork. I mean, I think this stuff is critical and it's how a lot of people are like, I just want to know how to survive and like get through. So I'm really excited that you're here doing this episode with us and that we're able to talk about some of this more from this to like navigating masculinity, some of that stuff that's just like day to day. I think we're on to frequently asked questions. So do you want to ask the first fact? Yeah, I don't think anybody says fact, dude. That's probably just you. What? <laughs> That's a Jesseism. That happens after two hours. <laughs> <laughs> we just got into a puddle. Okay, so moving on to questions that I've heard asked in the community often. Um, a lot of it is around order of things and, you know, obligations. If you do a name change, do you have to do this? So the first question is, do you have to change your sex marker when you change your name? No. There are lots of reasons to think about 
why you might want to. And that has to do with kind of who each individual person is and what safety looks like to you and how often, whether you're dealing with a document that people interact with frequently or infrequently and kind of what your personal appearance is, what, how people read you. It's very much a personal decision. Typically people do them together because of the healthcare sort of hurdles that folks have to jump. The name change is generally the first thing that I see people do, um, but but that's certainly not universal. I mean, lots of people actually don't change their name for whatever reason. And so so I often see it be sort of either name and gender change together or name change and then later gender change. But it's very much a personal decision. They by no means have to happen absolutely together. So it's, it's just something to kind of think about what institution you're interacting with and what your path is. And that's something that I think is, is, you know, the legal clinic can help walk through also in terms of, you know, sort of a global sense of what is this interaction going to look like and strategically what makes sense for me to do. Okay, the next one is, do you have to update all your documents at once? And you kind of just covered that. You covered it more in terms of name change and gender marker, but this would be uh, other documents other than your driver's license. For example, would your passport be valid if you have legally changed your name or if you have a driver's license with your new legal name? Can you update your, your gender marker on your passport but have your driver's license have your previously assigned marker on it yeah this is it's kind of a big question i mean i think that there's there's a lot of different ways that that the different documents and pads on this you know particular web can interact and it kind of depends on what you're doing for the passport for example and in, in order to have a passport you know the passport either, either stands by itself right you present it to somebody and that's it and you don't need anything else or it has to be in order to be correct it has to be correct in conjunction with your driver's license, right? Or whatever the other supporting document is, your birth certificate that you presented to the passport agency, to the Department of State to get your passport changed. So there's some sort of, some that follow directly from one another. I think that it, it kind of depends on on what documents you're talking about. You know, again, the, the court orders and the physician letters are generally the starting place. The driver's license is generally the starting place because it's the document that people interact with most. And it's the document that is used as backup for so many other documents. Mm -hmm. I would say the social security card because of the employment issues is also a big priority. And those are things that can be sort of baseline documents for other changes. So that's just sort of something to think about what is required to get to what and where you're going and what you need the document for in terms of what you want to do. So the next question, which I'm really curious to hear the feedback on, how changing your identity documents impacts things like employment and health insurance and tax returns and all of these things that sometimes can mean really different costs or consequences in regards to how they, like for example, I've had a lot of for me, I haven't up updated my sex marker change, not because some people don't do it for me automatically, mm -hmm. but because for me, when accessing healthcare, I sometimes need care that is around what I call my original plumbing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I've, I've actually had a conversation with a health provider. And since I don't like them very much, I'm just going to say Aetna. I had a gynecological visit pre-transition and then I accessed the same care, but since they had updated unaware to myself, updated my marker, even though I have no legal claim to that as M, they denied my gynecological visit and they were going to make me pay out of pocket because as a male, I shouldn't be needing that service. And even when I called to explain that, yes, I still have a cervix. Yes, I still have ovaries, although, you know, I am on testosterone and I have a legal name change. I still need these, this care and nothing's changed in that regards. And I asked, well, you know, I'm clarifying to you that it's not a... It's not a computer glitch. It's not that somebody built incorrectly. Like I have these parts. I said, you know, what can I do? Well, for me, I actually just could direct them to my employer to verify that I haven't had a sex marker change and that cleared it up. But I asked them directly, like, what if I changed my marker? And they said we were, would then refer you to legal so that I would actually have to have a conversation with the insurance legal department around my sex marker. So that for me is the big holdback because I know I still have certain things that would be deemed female care and that's why I haven't updated. But what's your information around that stuff? I find the medical insurance issue particularly emotionally difficult one because I feel like it's so hard already for our community to access care and it's so scary already and it's such a personal and private interaction. And then to have to deal with medical insurance companies on top of it just is it's unacceptable and I don't know what to do about it. You know, I shake my fist at the, you know, the heavens and at the institutions and the information that I have about it is very basic legal information. And I don't know that it's doesn't sort of feed the, the need for care. 
right? And the need for good care and competent care and paid for care. You know, medical insurance companies can feel, it's not that they can feel like these sort of bureaucratic behemoths. They are these bureaucratic sort of monsters that it can be very difficult to navigate. The first thing I will say is if you're dealing with a medical insurance company, there is an appeals process for how things are built. That process may be very difficult to access, but one exists. I can virtually guarantee that somewhere in your medical insurance company, there is an appeals process. And you might have to talk to somebody in legal. You might have to, you know, jump through a thousand flaming hoops, but there generally is one to access. And and that's actually something that we have helped folks with at the legal clinic in the past who have gotten insurance company denials and who need help figuring out how do I phrase a letter? You know, how do I advocate for myself in the system? What's the right legal language to have? When I say legal language, it's not a statutory thing. You know, the, the statutes around medical insurance companies and med medical insurance coverage are very complicated. I confess I don't actually understand them all that well. There's sort of like, there's this sort of niche practice of attorneys who understand these things and pretty much no other attorneys want to know about it. <laughs> but, you know, the people who understand it really understand it and they have like job security for life because nobody else understands it. I would generally say is if you're dealing with trouble with your insurance company in terms of getting coverage paid for and you feel like you're not making headway, you know, talk to the legal clinic if you're in King County, but also talk to other legal providers and read that documentation really carefully or have somebody who understands how to read that awful medical insurance contractual language, read it with you and change it into comprehensible you know, language, figure out how to advocate for yourself. Because it's very much an, an interaction with the company and it's not a statutory protection necessarily. It's not a, there's not like a case law protection necessarily for a lot of how these interactions look with medical insurance companies. In terms of what the statutes do, under the Washington Law Against Discrimination, you cannot be denied coverage because you're trans, right? You cannot be charged different rates because you're trans, rates in, in, in terms of premiums. Now, this is not tested in the courts. This is a law that is on the books and the, the Human Rights Commission, which is the, the Washington state agency that's tasked with enforcing RCW 4960, which is the Washington Law Against Discrimination, they have a position on this and you can go to the Human Rights Commission website and see what their position is on it and what their description of the legal coverage is. It's not tested in the courts. I haven't seen it. I haven't had the opportunity to sort of bring that particular hammer down on a medical insurance provider um, and I don't know anyone who has. So it's a little bit of, a, of an open field in terms of what I'm aware of. All of that being said, treatment for sort of gender related stuff is often categorically denied under insurance plans. So it will just have a categorical exclusion. Like if you read through your, your medical insurance exclusions, very often it's, you know, transgender, you know, slash transsexual, whatever the clinical language that they've developed is for who we are and what we do is excluded. That has changed with some sort of progressive activism with companies, some public employers. San Francisco was the first city to take away that exclusion. And through some very powerful activism there and some really creative activism there, I actually wrote a paper on it in law school. San Francisco was the first city to do that. Seattle just recently uh, took away that exclusion as well. It was very interesting in San Francisco, they were worried about the sort of flood of trans folks coming to San Francisco specifically to get their their stuff covered, you know, and like coming to work for the city just to get their stuff covered. And there was all of this like brouhaha about like how it was going to bankrupt the city, blah, blah, blah. And, and the actuarial costs are actually very low. They ended up actually having to give money back to San Francisco city employees because it ended up costing so much less than they had projected. And they had started, you know, pulling out to cover that. Now that those numbers are out there, there's a little bit more room. So, so more and more employers are, are asking that, that that exclusion be taken out of their coverage. There's some question also with respect to the whatever protection it is that the Washington Law Against Discrimination gives, and we're not entirely clear what that protection is at this point. There's some federal preemption questions. Um, there's a, a law called ERISA that deals with employee benefits and what this federal law governs versus what state laws govern. And it's a very complicated area of law. So the general sort of take home message is that most people in my understanding are not experiencing different premiums because of, of being trans and that sort of thing. What they're dealing with is actually what you were mentioning is the, or denials of covered care. And that's more of an internal to the insurance company question, like dealing with their internal machinations to get things covered and then dealing with your employer, whomever is, whomever your insurance comes from. And here I'm not actually talking about public insurance plans. That is an entirely different area. And I actually don't know very much about that. So I'm not going to talk about it. Come to the legal clinic. We will find someone who knows about it to talk to you. But in terms of private insurance, you're dealing with it sort of internal to the insurance company and you're dealing with your employer's 
categorical exclusions for trans coverage. So the one thing I wanted to also just pipe in about, because I've experienced this and maybe you could answer this around the legalities of it, but I am a te I'm technically a Washington State employee, mm -hmm. but the Washington State has a writer that's written in around trans care. So my medication, my testosterone, mm -hmm. is literally $48 more because of my sex marker being F versus M, even though it's, you know, just a prescription. It's mm -hmm. You know, this is not including like labs or any of the actual instances, but as far as discrimination, I think it's still legal. I mean, they, Sylvia Rivera Project, when they presented at Seattle University, talked about this, that gender affirming pharma pharmaceuticals, which would be hormones, you can still legally, you know, disparage a certain community and just charge them more. I would defer to the Sylvia Rivera Law Project on this. They've done a lot more sort of research and, and progress on this than I can credit to the legal clinic. I think there's a lot of issues with the medical insurance and 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 how to how to be gender affirmed by your medical insurance plan. You know, I would say instances like that are discriminatory whether they are instances that fall under statutes that protect against discrimination is a very different question. Lots and lots and lots of things are discriminatory and terrible and oppressive and are not illegal. As an attorney, I struggle with, you know, especially in the employment context, I deal with people every day who experience terrible, terrible, terrible things at their places of work, and they're perfectly legal things. Mm -hmm. And that is a horrible conversation to have every single time. And so that's why, I, you know, I do talk a lot about survival strategies and I do talk a lot about best practices because the law is not necessarily going to be there for you to fall back on in terms of, of something being a statutory violation or being illegal. I mean, there are a lot of things where there ought to be a law. You know, people say that all the time. There ought to be a law. Well, you know, I agree. There ought to. <laughs> sometimes there isn't. Sometimes very often there isn't. Dean Spade's new book that came out is just sort of one of the sort of speaks to that, that the law is pretty limited in what it can do and sort of looks to more like social movement type things. And other books have touched on that as well. And I think, you know, there is a time when it's time to hit the streets and start doing more community organizing because the legal system can let us down over and over again. So I think that's why we talk about that a lot on here. Mm -hmm. And like we said, this this episode is about what, what the reality is today. And if you were to get up tomorrow and want to do some of this stuff, this is these are the hoops that you have to jump through. But that's by no means to say that it's okay and not oppressive. The other thing I just wanted to add is around insurance and stuff. I think it's going to get real interesting in 2014 when the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is implemented and actually we start seeing what's happening. It's probably good that we don't know you know, in terms of public insurance, because it's all going to change so much anyway. I just know sort of look, working in the publicly funded mental health system that everything's going to sort of get turned on its head. I think it's going to be slow, but I think there's going to be a lot of change. And I know we recently posted on our Facebook page a document that talked about how the Affordable Care Act is going to affect trans folks. And I think it's really great. It's not considered a pre-existing condition. <laughs> So that was a win for us. I'll go into the last question. And did you want to add? So the other thing, like a part of that question that we kind of segued into healthcare around was uh, around like legal documents as far as like tax returns or maybe wills. That if your name changes and you're written to the will with your previous names, it still apply. Like, do you have any information around that kind of stuff? Sure. To speak to the tax, again, this is sort of a best practices issue. You know, there's not a, I, I'm not aware of in the IRS an official document you can fill out to let them know like this change is happening. They go on social security number for most things um, in my experience. And so if you have your social security number, that marker changed, you know, you're probably going to be okay. They, they're not necessarily an institution that's invested in your gender. Surprise, there's one. <laughs> they're invested in your money. <laughs> they don't care what you right. are. Right, they don't they care what you are. They account. just, that's right. They that's just want your money. So that's that's my thought on that. I mean, if you get flack, I think it's something that an explanatory letter can help you fix, deal with. But they're, they're an institution that where, in my experience, that's not, their, that's not their prerogative. With respect to, I think you sort of asked a question about wills, and I don't know a great deal about wills and inheritance, but that is another area where a court-ordered name change, that actually having the the A changed to B name can be helpful because then you can show you've got a document that shows like, hey, I was this person, you know, I am this person mm -hmm. in under a new name. There's not really necessarily specific laws that I'm aware of about that, but it's sort of more of what documents you have to show that you are that person that they're looking for. As far as the social security, I know that like the name change isn't sealed and that they can access that. But when you legally change your social security card and you get that with the name, mm -hmm. How long is it before they kind of like just start going off your new reflected on your card name? I know that I got employment like seven or eight months after my name change and they addressed the letter like 
dear miss slash mister so that they still had both information for like months and months and months so i wondered if if your employer if you were to go and, and show that it would be a no match but will it come up with your other name if they run that number it sounds like potentially um <laughs> i i don't know how quickly they're able to turn that around i mean i can certainly speculate that as a government institution you know there are yeah there there are varying degrees of uh speed. <laughs> um, again, one of those things to kind of keep your eye on as you're changing these sort of gatekeeping documents and what are the gates you're going to have to go through and what are you going to have to show to go through them and, and just try and be proactive about it and, and aware. Ask for help if you feel stuck or if you feel worried about what might happen. There's a lot of fear about the legal community and, and attorneys and, and being able to access attorneys. And I think that some of that fear is earned. You know, the legal system is a scary system and it can be very difficult for attorneys to hear that the legal system is a scary system. I mean, I've devoted five years of my life now to interacting pretty much exclusively with the legal system. And there are things that happen in it that I think are, you know, okay. And then there are things that happen in it that I think are absolutely not okay. And so not every attorney is going to have the space for whatever reason to to think that through and i would just encourage folks to access the legal services that are there um, and that are geared towards our community the transgender law center is a great resource the national center for lesbian rights despite their name actually does a fantastic amount of trans and queer related work and they also have a helpline that you can call actually a friend of mine from law school is their their lawyer on the helpline and is a lovely person <laughs> and the lambda legal also has a helpline and then there are legal clinics sort of you know in different places around the country you know we are able to serve king county and legal voice um, is a local organization that has an information and referral line as well that can help you help direct you to resources and the aclu also has lgbt project so there's more and more of these legal organizations sort of that have information and referral lines i mean they're that limited service may not be able to sort of walk all the way with you through a process that you may be sort of looking more towards private attorneys but they'll get you started and they help you learn the language and also there's a website called washington law help it's washingtonlawhelp.org here in washington that has tons of self-help packets and some of the packets that they have are particularly useful for things like how to communicate with an attorney how to choose an attorney what do fee structures look like i we actually give people those pretty frequently at the clinic because what we're doing is we do our 30 minute sort of triage we help you identify what is this legal issue that i have you know sometimes people come in they're like i have a problem i think it's a legal problem it looks maybe like a legal problem i don't know what kind of legal problem it is and you know even just helping direct people towards here's the area of law you should be looking at is a good start and then we you know we frequently give out these packets that say okay so once you call an attorney here's what you can kind of expect to happen and i would also say be willing to do a little bit of research in your area for queer and trans supportive attorneys you know i have a private practice i, I don't work for a nonprofit. i don't work for a legal services agency i work for a law firm teller and associates and our law firm happens to be very, very LGBT supportive, and I happen to have a lot of leeway to do work on behalf of the community and to take clients on behalf of the community. And we sort of advertise that. It's not something that people always expect from a private attorney. So I would say do some research in your area to find out, like, are there attorneys who in their private practices do this? You know, do they do pro bono work on the side? Many attorneys do. Ask for help when you need it. And if you have a bad interaction with it, an attorney, I'm sorry on behalf of the profession and keep trying because, you know, there are folks out there who can, who are really, you know, able to, to, and willing to direct folks to, to good people. So I think just like a lot of the things that we talk about getting um, services in the trans community, a lot of it's word of mouth and just sort of knowing and connecting with community, which is why having community is so critical. So hopefully you hear some things today that are helpful to you if you're in Washington or just sort of good rules of thumb and places to go and sort of ways to look at things if you're not. And so this leads us into our very last question. Thank you for so much for being here with us. This is turning into a pretty long sort of extended version episode. So 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Sean said, just like the legal system, it does sort of match the topic, doesn't it? It's never simple. So our final frequently asked question is, does QLaw have any projects it's working on around identity documents for trans individuals? And any other projects you want to talk about? Do you need volunteers or how can people get involved with QLaw? And actually, I think earlier when you were talking about attorneys doing this work, I was actually thinking about this question because I was like, if there's attorneys out there listening to this episode that want to get more involved, it sounds like that would be a good strategy for them too to contact you if they're in this area. Anything more you want to add about QLaw and then any sort of final thoughts you have today? Yeah, thank you for that. I do encourage attorneys who are listening to reach out and to, to get in touch with the legal clinic or just to get in touch with me because I love nerding out about this thing, these things. And if there are other attorneys who are willing to nerd out with me, I want to do it. <laughs> so in terms of what Law and the, the GLBT Legal Clinic have percolating, we are always looking for volunteers and, and attorney and law student volunteers as well as community volunteers. You know, you don't have to have a legal background to help out with us. We are constantly doing publicity in terms of sending out our flyers, you know, reaching out to media, going to events tabling, that sort of thing. And that is a vast amount of work. Frankly, attorneys are terrible at publicity. You, you may have noticed that I tend to go on and on and on about fairly boring legal processes. So you can imagine what I'm like at Pride, right? <laughs> You're somebody who has, you know, has an interest in publicity and wants to help us out. We don't exist without clients. If, we, if our community doesn't know about us, you know, we might as well all just go home and watch the football game. We have that ability. We also have volunteer possibilities for phone intake to help sort of bring in clients for in-person intake. So greeting people at the clinic, um, making it a welcoming space. And I want to particularly open that up to trans and queer identified in King County who want to, because of the folks that we serve, we want all kinds of of folks to be the first face that people see at the clinic. You know, it's very, it's very important that, that we are a safe and welcoming place. And so if you want to be a part of that, we want volunteers to do that. And that is a very much not a legal skills kind of a job. It's, it's very much a like, hi, welcome. And let me help you fill out this intro demographic form kind of thing. We also um, need volunteers for research um, and helping to put together community resources so that our attorneys have the ability to kind of, you know, give out current community resources. And we also do a lot of pre-research on our client issues because the issues that affect the queer and trans community are very rarely straightforward legal issues. You know, very rarely do we have somebody walk in and be like, ah, I know exactly what you need to do. You know, there is a law about this, <laughs> you know. And more frequently, it because I'm queer or trans or, you know, GLBT, I have this particular twist on a legal question. Or they're just interacting with the legal system in a potentially new and novel way. Often that also has to do with, you know, stuff related to income and interacting with the legal system and you know, with your rights within institutions based on poverty. And so we do a lot of pre-research to make sure that that 30 minutes isn't just like, meh, we're not quite sure what you should do. Try this, you know, like we know that people, you know, know how to write stuff into Google and, you know, probably have done a little bit of work on their own. You know, we try and make it a really substantive service. We can always use help for research. That takes a little bit more legal knowledge, but not always. Sometimes it's, you know, as I was saying earlier, there's anecdotal, there's tons and tons of anecdotal wisdom in our community. And so there's, there's room for that as well. I always like to say, you know, everyone has a place in the revolution. I will find a place for you in this revolution if you want to join. You know, some of the other projects that we have are one of my sort of dreams for this year is to put together a self-help packet specifically for these court orders. The process is, you know, the paperwork is definitely there and, you know, we can help people walk through it, but it's helpful just to know, you know, to help have a packet that, that tells you when you walk into the court, this is the room you go to. Here's the person you talk to. It's a very step-by-step -step and detailed process. We have one for second parent adoptions because that was a, you know, that's a huge area of service that we, that we do and a process that people often do without an attorney. And the other big one is these gatekeeping documents. There's very good resources out there for a lot of stuff that's more general, things like the passport packet from NCTE and the ACLU packet on rights generally in Washington state. But what I would like to put together is a King County self-help packet for people who are doing this in King County with that knowledge like you were talking about earlier Sean about you know well I went to the court and it took this amount of time and you know I had to figure out who to talk to and those sorts of things just bringing all of that knowledge together in one packet so that people who are going through this process can have that and it's very useful I mean I actually did a second parent adoption recently and used our packet because <laughs> I had never done one before and I was like oh okay so this is how it goes and that was put together by somebody who was doing happens to me an attorney but was also doing their own 
And so she just kind of took really good notes <laughs> and put together this, you know, spent a lot of time putting together this packet. So we'd like to do something similar for these these sort of identity documents and particularly the court orders. And then, you know, the final thing I'll touch on is the on-site clinics. Um, if you're working with an organization or you're involved with an organization or you use an organization that serves the queer and trans community and you feel like there are legal needs that could be addressed or frankly, if you just, you know, feel like gosh, the people I know could really use this. We have this ability to do these on-site legal clinics and essentially talk to your organization and figure out, okay, so what's going to work for your folks? And can we adapt what we're doing so that we are a, a better service for you, right? I very much believe in this idea of, you know, the institution not being, being worth a whole lot if it doesn't meet the needs of the people who are using it. And so we meet a need with the monthly legal clinic and there are other needs out there. And we, we, I certainly don't, as the chair of the committee coordinating how this legal clinic is happening and, you know, managing all the volunteers, I certainly don't pretend to know what the needs of our community are, right? There's tons of stuff out there and I have no idea, you know, what the needs are. We started this program to kind of try and address those and, and partner up and figure out what those are and be sort of more holistic in our approach rather than just like, well, you guys should come to us, you know? And that's something that's very central to our mission is, is partnership and building alliances. Thank you for asking, where, where is the clinic? Right Right now, we are generously hosted by Seattle Counseling Services, which is at the corner of Pine and Melrose in Seattle. As I mentioned, we do research issues ahead of time, so we're a little bit less equipped to do drop-ins, and that's really for the purposes of the people we're serving. But you can call ahead of time and make an appointment, 206-235-7235, get set up, and you can do it up until I think that generally we, we do our last scheduling the Tuesday before clinic just to give us a couple of days to figure things out and make sure we've got the issue researched and we've got an attorney who can talk about it and those sorts of things. But we definitely try and, and get everybody in. If there's a need, we do our very, very best to meet it. And I do also just want to note, again, you know, if you're somebody who needs ongoing legal representation, like you need someone to go to court with you for something, we unfortunately right now are not that service. You know, and again, I say that to manage expectations. I don't ever want to feel like people come to us and don't feel helped, right? But some of that is, you know, knowing what it is that we do exactly. Um, we can help you find those folks. Uh, we can't go to court with you at this point. We'd like to change that. We're working on changing that and growing. We, within that sort of the consultation context can, you know, can take all kinds of, of folks and take all kinds of issues and, and make it work. Wow. <laughs> 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 so I know that was a lot of information for folks, but I know that it's a much discussed topic and I constantly hear the need for folks like what are in your gender journey. Folks have questions about this all the time. So I really hope that this was helpful. Please access QLA if you need those resources in your um, in King County. And again, send us emails if you have questions, we questions or comments or have experienced certain things and we could uh, forward that along. So that's it really. You know, after four hours, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, so thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you taking your time um, out. It sounds like you do a lot of work for the community. So this is, you know, an extra two hours, three hours. <laughs> and we know how time is valuable. So we really appreciate you coming on. Well, and I want to thank you both for the work that you're doing with this, with this podcast. And, you know, I, I mean, I really like the podcast. And I want to thank you for having me come and talk about these things and, you know, and be able to at least talk directly to your King County and Washington listeners and provide a little bit of guidance for folks in other, other places. And I'm sorry for people who listen from Sweden, <laughs> because there was almost nothing there for you. <laughs> but, but I I thank you. I thank you both very much for having me. It's my pleasure. I hope we get to have a, a great relationship in the future. Yeah, I think there was lots of lots of follow up topics in there that will definitely be coming. I know that we've been trying to brew around a workplace episode, so definitely. So that wraps up episode thirty two on navigating gender identity documents. Thanks again to Denise and Q Law for coming on. And this is GenderCast signing off. Copyright 2012, GenderCast, our transmasculine gender query. All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me, cause inside is a boy. Trying to break free He doesn't want to take over My body or my soul 
He just wants to share this body, make me whole. Cause the girl this world does see is only half of me. I am not the only one born under this golden sun. Beneath the surface, you will find. The million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new Start with knowledge small, takes time to learn it all Learn to live, leave it all behind Accept the different and find the peace of mind Make us who we are, what we know. Some of us are scared to let it show. Let it all scream, This is me. Now it's time that the whole world see. I am not the only one born under this golden. Beneath the surface you will find A million thoughts that cross my mind A million paths that can 